I can go ahead and do that unless you'd like to. Uh, well, I'll, I can start it off, yeah. Okay, terrific. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, this uh, Code Pink's, uh, there was something that came across my, uh, my vision and uh, I, and I thought, the one thing that grabbed my attention was the Thrivent thing because Thrivent is located right downtown, Thrivent Financial. And, and then to find out that Thrivent Financial is heavily invested in the, in the uh, weapons industry, uh, that I said, well, uh, we have to get involved with it here. And, we, and fortunately, we have uh, our Veterans for Peace group. We also have our Women Against Military Madness that we work very, very closely with. In fact, I'm a member of WAM. And I think Lucia might be a member of Vets for Peace, so we're we're kind of we're kind of uh, there's an ancestral relationship there in a good way, and um, and so I thought, well, this is something that we 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 need to get involved with, and then then I uh, started a communication with you, Nancy, and uh, so that that was my link into it, and and this is something that um, you know. Uh, I think I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, uh, we all know that boycott and divest was an important, if not the most important part of bringing down the apartheid in South Africa. And uh, we've seen with uh, Black Lives Matter, with uh, 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 the increased, uh, uh, it put such a scare into corporate America. You saw the, uh, the, the team, the football team from Washington with their, uh, the team president, uh, uh, Daniel Snyder, for years denied, uh, he just denied the fact that, uh, uh, that that nickname for the team was a racial slur. And he was just, he, he just ignored people. But you know what? When FedEx and a couple other corporate people, uh, sponsors decided to pull out because of the name, all of a sudden he was woke and he became an anti-racist, and and so we can't have that name. It's racist. So sometimes, uh, for corporate America to uh, to grow a conscience, you have to kind of hit them where it hurts. Nancy, you can take over. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Dave. So Dave gave you a little uh, bit of background of um, how we um, came together um, in putting this webinar to. Uh, together for you all. Uh, just to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. Um, it is the Divest from the War Machine Boycott, Boycott Strategies and Tools webinar. Uh, so if that's not why you're here, then uh, maybe you're at the wrong Zoom room, but uh, we'll teach you how to take action to reduce violent global conflicts and slow the hyper militarization of our world by divesting from the US war machine. Uh, the divest from the war machine uh, webinar will teach individual investors um, and even yourself um, how to take action. So maybe what we can do is go around um, the room and have our featured speakers introduce themselves. And while they are doing that, maybe you all can drop uh, in the chat your name and where you are Zooming in from and any affiliated organizations. So maybe what I can do is I can just, um, maybe we can start with Lucia. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lucia Wilkes Smith and I am active in Minneapolis in an almost 40 year old organization named Women Against Military Madness. And there are men and women who are members, but the leadership is, is made up of women. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Um, maybe we can hear from Cody. Sure, hey everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Cody. Um, I'm an organizer with Code Pink which is like WAM, a woman-led anti-war uh, organization. Um, I organize with the Divest from the War Machine campaign. So very happy to join y'all tonight. Great, and maybe we could hear from, uh, from Carly. 
Thanks, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Really great to see you. Uh, my name is Carly Town. I'm also with Code Pink, and I'm very excited to uh, talk to people about the Divest from the War Machine campaign today. Okay, and then we have uh, one more member of our team. We have Mary Miller, who's actually behind the scenes right now. Um, this webinar, the technical aspects of it couldn't happen without her expertise. So we're lucky to have her um, as she's uh, moving you all into different rooms. And Mary, maybe you'd like to introduce yourself? Sure, hi everyone. My name is Mary. I have been with Code Pink for about eight months now. I do a few different jobs. I write and I work on social media. And if you attend our Code Pink Congress events, you might recognize me because I also do a lot of work with them, and that is why I have so much Zoom expertise now. So I'm running your, your tech here. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Mary. Um, so the way the uh, we're going to format this uh, tonight is we're going to hear from our panelists, our speakers, and then um, we will go into uh, breakout rooms. Uh, and the breakout rooms are rooms that you get to choose from, um, that you get to join instead of someone just randomly putting you into a room. We will have uh, breakout rooms that address boycott, divestment, and sanctions. We will have another breakout room uh, titled uh, City-Based Organizing Against the War Machine. And they then we'll have a third room, uh, which is called uh, Defund uh, the Pentagon. So, um, Dave, is there anything I'm missing? Should we just get get right into it? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Okay. You better well, do the introduction, so I'll allow you. you to do the introduction. Okay. Well, let's go ahead, and I will hand it over to Lucia and. Um, <laughs> who will be presenting uh, to us. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thinking about uh, div divesting from thrivent corporation has brought to my mind some tactics and strategies that we have used through Women Against Military Madness, or WAM, and uh, another uh, uh, community, uh, that I have been working with, the Minnesota BDS community, a coalition of groups and uh, individuals. And so I'm going to go through some slides, which I just had up on the screen a moment ago. Aha. Okay. There it is. Good, okay, here we go. Okay, thank you. Now, so here is a little introduction to WAM and our, our logo. Um, BDS, as you may know, is an international campaign boycott, divest and sanction that uh, has to do with uh, raising awareness about human rights and civil rights that must be granted to uh, Palestinian people. So it's to put pressure on the government of Israel. Come on, whoops, one. Um, it's important when we're putting, when, when we're putting pressure on a corporation or on some kind of, uh, uh, organization or Congress or our, our legislature to use many approaches. And I'm suggesting that it's always good to have some printed information. Now, when we've been working so much during the pandemic without printed information, without leaflets and flyers, or even little postcard sized fact sheets that you can hand to people, um, I think that it is always important to have something uh, tangible in print that people can return to after they perhaps have heard your, your oral argument. So I think that when I think about tactics for influencing and bringing social change and social justice, 
Uh, it's important to also create a multiple ways through social media to approach those entities. It's important in influencing corporations to reach out to boards of directors and shareholders of those organizations. So, you know, get on the agenda. You notice that each of these points is an action verb. And I am a believer in action and I know that Code Pink is too. So reach out, get on the agenda, make a, and then reiterate your points in writing. Submit questions in writing. Um, we did this recently with General Mills Corporation, which is based in Minnesota, and Minnesota is very proud of being the home of General Mills. And But when the shareholders meeting was coming up, uh, which was done virtually, uh, we were able, people who, we, we found people who were shareholders in General Mills, and they pre presented questions uh, virtually to the shareholders meeting. It's important too to educate the larger community and we do that with rallies and even little clusters of people holding signs. And then it's important to, and I have to stress this, to connect with the media that is actually seen by those people who make the decisions. So sometimes that is the mainstream media most often. It's always good to make a colorful flyer. Uh, this one we used, uh, the BDS community has used to, uh, to influence legislators as we are uh, working about anti, working on uh, repealing anti-boycott statutes in Minnesota. But it's always good to have something that's a little bit colorful, literally in color. Um, in Minnesota, the State Board of Investment has, which is responsible for a huge uh, pension funds for all state employees, including public school teachers. And the decisions are the elected officials of our state. And the BDS community has made statements to this group regarding divestment from a corporation called Elbit Systems based in Haifa, Israel. And it's known for field testing as we, the term that's used on weapons on Palestinian people in Gaza. And it also does surveillance along the US-Mexico border. Sometimes it's important just to have a little group of people show up and be seen by the public. And by, in this case, women engineers who were going into um, a uh, uh, support system for women engineers, many of whom were working for Lockheed Martin. And so we just notified them that we're present and we're here. In uh, last September, just before the shareholders annual meeting, uh, we had about 45 or 50 people at a rally uh, outside of General Mills Corporation. This big sculpture that's red is the big G for General Mills. And people driving by saw us. Je the corporation was aware we were out there because they called the police and we had a chat with the police, but we were visible and clear about what we were doing. Um, sometimes, there's an opportunity to be a little playful. So because Pillsbury is now part of General Mills Corporation and Pillsbury has a factory in disputed area, stolen land in East Jerusalem, there's a boycott across the country and throughout the world of uh, Pillsbury baking products. And so here we have our friend Noam in a Pillsbury Doughboy costume saying, I made this with no Pillsbury products and showing off his uh, pumpkin pie. And so sometimes in some context, it's possible to use some humor and be a bit playful. And that reaches people in a different way. So it's good to make use of Pillsbury, uh, 
of symbols that the public understands. For example, the Pillsbury Doughboy, who is wearing a mask in this photo that you can see, and he's out on a street corner in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, to say something's wrong, Pillsbury, hmm. And this is my last point, and I want to stress it over and over. Um, reach out to mainstream media because those shareholders and those boards of directors are reading and hearing from mainstream media. Uh, I don't think Wham has ever been quoted on the in the business section of the Minneapolis Star Tribune before, but we were last September, right around the time of the General Mills. Uh, shareholders meeting. And it's possible sometimes if you know someone who knows someone to find a reporter who will carry a story forward. And that is my message today is as we approach these corporations and entities to use many different tactics all at the same time and um, carry on, carry on bravely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucia. That was really fantastic. And the, the tactics that you all are using at WAM are definitely tactics that we use at Code Pink. And um, if anyone is interested, Lucia will be holding a breakout group um, after we listen to the next, uh, to our next speakers. Um, but I really am excited that you brought up the point of AGM season, shareholder season is coming up and it is a great uh, way to insert your message and to apply pressure to, um, to the powers uh, that be. Um, so uh, if everyone, if you have questions, if you can hold on and um, hold any sort of suggestions or concerns or anything to, to the, uh, to, uh, for the breakout sessions. So um, let's see, who do we have up next? It looks like uh, up next is, I'd like to invite uh, Carly Town um, as our next speaker. Thanks so much, Nancy. Um, and thanks so much for that, Lucia. That was brilliant. I love um, seeing those tactics that you all are using. Um, so I'm also gonna go ahead and share my screen so folks can see the presentation I have for you today. Uh, again, thanks so much for being here. My name is Carly Town. Um, I'm a co-director of Code Pink and I work most closely on our Divest from the War Machine campaign, um, which works to divest our schools, our cities, um, our politicians, and other financial institutions um, from the war machine. So I'm gonna take us through just a general um, presentation about what our Divest from the War Machine campaign is. Um, I'm going to go over a few specific points, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Cody to go over a couple of um, other tactics that we use. So um, to start, right, uh, our Divest from the War Machine campaign um, operates under a very simple premise, which is if we're going to end war, we have to stop allowing companies to profit from war. Um, I think everyone here can agree with that. Um, and, you know, with that understanding in mind, we, we talk a little bit about um, how the war machine actually operates and what each of these points, um, when we identify the war machine, um, how we can actually intervene as a community and take on the war machine. So you see on the screen, um, while this is not um, in total, the entire way that the US war machine operates, it is a good snapshot of the ways that we can intervene. So we talk a lot about how weapons manufacturers produce the arms and technology uh, that make wars possible. Um, and in the process, making a huge profit, uh, weapons manufacturers use their huge profits to fund the campaigns of politicians, which is something I'm going to be talking to you a little bit more about today. Um, politicians vote to extend existing wars, engage in new conflicts, and steadily increase the Pentagon budget as a result. And then underlying this entire dynamic is the fact that large financial institutions like banks and um, asset managers invest heavily in these weapons manufacturers. And you can see it's a very cyclical process, right? So the Divest from the War Machine campaign identifies these points, as I said, as points for intervention um, as members of the community who want to end the war machine. So those different points, like I said earlier, um, we talk about divesting our city and state from the war machine. 
um, divesting our universities, so diver our university endowments, working to hold financial institutions that invest in weapons manufacturers accountable, um, and then finally, working to divest our politicians and representatives from the war machine, which is actually what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today, while Cody will be talking more about city and state campaigns. So let's talk about politicians. Um, you know, how do war profiteers exert so much influence over our politicians? Well, again, a very cyclical, cyclical process, like I mentioned, right? Weapons manufacturers use their profits to donate to their campaigns. Politicians vote to extend existing wars, engage new conflicts, increase the Pentagon budget, right? Um, and that's, that's a dynamic that we've all seen play out um, from our politicians. So let's also kind of take a step back also and understand the scale of the problem and, and how campaign contributions from weapons companies present such an extreme conflict of interest. Um, in 2021, the Pentagon budget is $740 billion, uh, which means we'll spend over a million dollars a minute on the Pentagon, uh, which putting it that way, I think is, is really startling for most people. Um, but importantly, half of the Pentagon budget will go directly to private defense contractors, of course, defense in air quotes, um, including weapons companies like Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, uh, Boeing. So this is a huge problem, right? Um, so in addition, I wanna mention that we dedicate so much of the Pentagon budget to creating and maintaining uh, weapons that the US military also sends quote unquote excess military grade weaponry to local police forces through the 1033 program, um, which you can see here was created in the 1990s during the war on drugs and has since transferred over $7.4 billion um, in excess property, including weapons to police forces that we know of, right? Um, and this image here is actually a Miami police officer um, from protests over this summer. So still very much a huge problem. So, you know, given these really outrageous statistics and, and, and the way that we see the war machine operating in our local communities um, and how our politicians vote to spend more and more money every year really to line the pockets of private defense contractors and how those so same military grid weapons are used um, against some of the most marginalized in our communities you know, what can we do about it, right? And that's why we're here today. Some resources and tips about how to take on the war machine in our own communities. So I wanna start off with a recent study um, that was done by the Security Policy Reform Institute, um, which found a direct correlation between contributions from the defense industry and voting to maintain or increase military spending. Again, I think we all know that this is the case, but seeing a study actually point this out is incredibly important. Um, I'll make sure people have access to that as well. So based on that, right, we are calling on everyone to reach out to their congressional representatives to sign the Code Pink pledge to commit to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons companies, right? If these contributions are, are correlated to them spending, voting to spend more on the Pentagon budget, we need to, we need to stop that um, contribution process in its tracks. Um, I want to show people a picture of the pledge that we ask people to bring to their politicians. Um, you can see here, it's very simple. We want them to commit to refusing campaign contributions of over $200 um, from PACs or executives or organizations representing the top five weapons manufacturers that are listed there. Um, and you can see that it's a very simple statement. And it's also a really good tool, right, to, what, to ask your politician this, your representative to sign this, and if they refuse, it's really great to ask them why, right? Why would you refuse money from companies that make a killing on killing? Um, in particular, um, I wanted to talk to you all about your congressional representatives. So we have congressional representatives who have already signed on, but we need more. Um, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar has not yet signed the Code Pink Pledge to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons manufacturers. That doesn't mean she hasn't done amazing things in, in Congress so far. She's actually been on the front line of calling to defund the Pentagon budget. But I think it would also be a really powerful tool to ask her to take a stance publicly against taking these campaign contributions from weapons manufacturers. 
Um, another study actually from the Security Policy Reform Institute was done um, to show that every member of Congress who has signed our pledge, the Code Pink pledge to divest from war, voted unanimously to um, move funds from the Pentagon to the people. So they voted to defund the Pentagon this past summer. Um, so it's, it's a really important tool that we can use in our communities and it would be a great way to also open up a conversation with your representative, Ilhan Omar, um, because we also have um, as a tool for people, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, we have a Code Pink's Guide to Pentagon Cuts. So when you go and talk to your representative, ask them to take that pledge to stop taking campaign contributions, we can also open the conversation and show them concrete ways that they can reduce the Pentagon budget and invest in our local communities, right? Because politicians will often say, we don't wanna, right? We don't wanna cut the Pentagon budget and reduce our security. The great thing is we have a list of, of um, Pentagon budget cuts we can make, how much money that will save. And you can show them very clearly that making these cuts won't, um, you know, cause any risk to our security, right? Um, for example, up here, I wanna point out, um, we, we could eliminate something that is commonly referred to as a slush fund account um, that would save us $174 billion a year. Um, and, and you can go through our guide to Pentagon budget cuts. Um, I'm going through them quickly here, but you can see at the bottom of the screen, um, the URL to see them on our website. I'll also make sure people have that in the chat box. Um, and yeah, so the two things that I talked about today, talking to your representatives to ask them to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons manufacturers, and also bringing them our guide to um, defunding the Pentagon, two really important ways to start taking on the, the war machine in our local communities. And I will stop here um, so I can have my colleague Cody continue the conversation as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Carly. Um, and thanks to Lucia also. I feel like, you know, definitely would echo what Carly said that a lot of the, the same tactics uh, that have been part of the BDS movement um, that Lucia was explaining are part and parcel <clears throat> for what we do with the Divest from the War Machine campaign. Um, because divestment, and, you know, Carly touched on this too, like divestment is just one tool. It's one aspect of general anti-war organizing to end U.S. militarism, which, as Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King said, um, even that's still true in our time today, one of the greatest threats to human rights around the world today. Um, and as Lucia mentioned, um, these tactics that are make that make concrete gains in um, in the anti-war movement uh, in cutting back in the war machine are also kind of feed this feedback loop of when you work with other activists um to do divestment work and you make little wins along the way you've done part of the work to educate people to actually learn what it means like what's possible what's possible when a movement of people gets together to make demands um and then further down the way you could probably see some of those people who you may have brought in to a campaign for the first time bringing in other people along the way and teaching them how to go. Um, I'm starting with this because uh, in my work through the Divest campaign, the same campaign that Carly was outlining, um, I work specifically with activists who are working to divest their city or state governments from uh, weapons companies. And so uh, what I've usually seen is that a city or state uh, campaign, usually a, a city campaign, is a very easy in to folks who maybe have never done any kind of anti-war organizing before. Um, so the, the context of the of municipal organizing is that many um, state, almost every state government, or city or state government, um, is invested in different companies in order to raise its assets. Um, this could mean, this takes a series of different forms, such as retirement plans, um, any kind of uh, funds that are um, given in for public education, um, many different ways that 
municipal governments uh, invest in, com in companies. Um, and many of them, you know, keep public records, but make it so hard to find that it's impossible to know um, what your city or state is actually invested in. Um, and so a, a good way to build up a movement um, to really get at uh, ending this practice that the whole federal government uh, takes part in, like what Carly was saying, is to get people involved in sort of an introductory uh, municipal campaign. So I don't have any slides to kind of go through, but I wanted to give a little bit of a um, sort of visual introduction of what it looks like to do some initial research into your uh, into a, a budding municipal campaign. So the first thing that that you'll want to do is to look at um, what are the different kinds of um, public funds that your city has. Um, a lot of the times this takes the form of a public retirement fund or some kind of public employee pension fund. Um, and you wanna do some research into how the city manages that because many cities just have their own public employees fund. But some like in the, the city I live in, I live in Portland, Oregon, the um, public employees of the city have their retirement fund through the state. So there is an Oregon state public uh, employees retirement system. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you know uh, how your city and state um, function and through their retirement systems. Um, and so let's say that you find uh, that your city has a public employees retirement fund. Um, you can usually find records that the fund keeps. This can usually be on um, uh, websites uh, where they'll actually even have a list of different reports because any kinds of investments that funds go, public funds go in have to have quarterly reports over how the fund is growing for their recipients. Um, I say it's usually there because it's not, not always. Um, it should always be there. Um, but as we found in some cities, we can search and search and search for the list of investments and it's nowhere to be found. And the city will try to put up a wall as much as they can to not let you know um, what your funds are invested in. Um, because many governments know that um, not only uh, weapons companies, but fossil fuel companies, private prisons have definitely stoked many mass movements to rise up and demand that they divest for human rights. Um, and so if a, a city or state website does not have um, these records on file, like they're legally supposed to, um, you can always file a Freedom of Information Act or use other methods to try to get the file because again, they are legally uh, required to make this information public. But then once you actually have the information, this is sort of the next um, line of defense, I'll call it for um, investors is that they'll say, okay, here's the information. Here's what all of our, uh, here's all the funds um, that our investments are going through. That's all you asked for. They won't tell you where the, a lot of those funds are invested in. And this is where we have some tools that you can use. Um, and so for the last couple of minutes, I wanted to just give a little bit of a demo. Um, so this is an example of a city retirement fund report. Um, and if you scroll through it, you will see the same thing. A lot of numbers, a lot of graphs, a lot of big words that is mostly financial jargon. Again, this is one of the lines of defense. They make it so that it's very hard to actually understand what any of this means. So I wanna scroll through this until we get to a page that looks a little like this. Oops, not that. We actually want it to look like this. So a table like this that actually has a, a line after line of a fund name with various numbers about how the assets were grown. When you have something like this, this is every specific fund um, or at, um, mutual fund that this retirement plan uses to grow its assets. Once you have this, all you need to do um, is to see what research has already been done with these funds. 
And so I'm going to take this example right here. This says Mellon large cap S&P 500. It's a lot of numbers and words. Basically, what it means is that this is uh, one fund by the Mellon company that is on the S&P 500 index. And so I'm going to go to this website that we can share the link to, the weapons free fund that Code Pink uses. Um, and I'm going to type in Mellon S and P 500. And this says that research has already been done to find out that the fund that any Mellon S and P 500 fund, um, these various ones are invested um, in weapons. It even gives you a, a rank. This one gets a D grade because if you look here, it's invested in Honeywell, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon. So this doesn't win you your campaign, but it gets you the initial research you need to, to start a municipal campaign and then rally different activists to demand that your city pull its funds, uh, its assets from these funds that invest directly in these companies. And so with that, I'm kind of at my time. I would love to talk more in the city-based organizing breakout group, but that's sort of a crash course of how you can start a municipal divest campaign. So I guess I'll pass it back to you, Nancy. Great, thank you so much, Cody. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Lucia. This is exactly what um, we are set up to do here. And that is to talk about strategies and to talk about tools uh, to divest from the war machine. So this is all really, really terrific. Um, before we move into our uh, breakout groups, um, I just, uh, Carly brought up asset management firms and I just want to uh, talk just really briefly um, about uh, one of the campaigns that I oversee. It's the BlackRock campaign. And um, I mean, war and conflict threatens life and the planet as we know it. And we all face global emergencies, but the financial industry has the power to lead the change that we need. So BlackRock, for those of you who don't know, is the world's large, biggest asset management firm uh, with more than $8 trillion in assets under management. It's also the world's top investor in nuclear weapons, climate destruction, private prisons, and weapon manufacturers. And for us um, in the BlackRock network, we believe if BlackRock moves to popular pressure that other asset management firms like Vanguard and State Street would follow suit. Um, and not just them, but maybe even financial fir firms like Thrivent, which is based there in, in Minneapolis. So that's just my little spiel on BlackRock if you're interested in learning more. But I just, before we go into our breakout groups, Dave, is there anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I, 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 by the way, uh, I'm, uh, all of our panelists really brought it in, in very concise and uh, uh, just really some real useful information. My God, I'm just, I'm blown away by it. And I thank you so much for your, all your hard work and your, and your, not only that, and presenting it in such a nice, concise way. That's beautiful. But uh, yeah, the only thing I would say is that the, the toughest part politically about uh, a lot of these uh, municipal funds is that the, the reasons they'll give you is that, hey, we got employees at pension funds and, and there's a lot of, a lot of labor um, cooperate, co cooperation with these funds. So the labor is saying, yeah, I, I understand that, you know, these are not uh, kosher kind of uh, groups, but uh, they're, uh, we, we wanna make sure that our employees get their, their pension, their pension fund doesn't run out, you know, and, and, I, and I think they will do that. And in, in some ways, uh, it, it would be really good to have uh, develop uh, a counter argument to that. So in going forward, so, so that if they say, well, well, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I feel like, yeah, we don't want to, but this is where the uh, guaranteed money is for our, our pension fund and protecting our, our hardworking people that worked their lives and, and expected their, their pension fund. And, uh, and they're, so you can understand that you're coming from their position on that, but to, um, 
I think that, that the alternative is to try to maybe uh, guide them in the direction of uh, green energy and, and, and uh, how green energy is the coming force and that, that they, they should be investing in green energy. Uh, so anyway, that's just what I have to say. Let's get the, uh, the breakout rooms. Okay, great. So um, we'll turn it over to uh, to Mary to um, uh, for the breakout uh, rooms. And just to remind everyone, uh, we will have a breakout group with Lucia on BDS and um, other points that she's raised today. Uh, we'll have another breakout group with Cody, city-based organizing against the war machine and uh, another breakout group with Carly uh, around the defund the Pentagon. So Mary, take it away. <laughs> okay, you're gonna see at the bottom, let's see, join breakout room. Is there a screen that pops up? Okay, there we go. Hmm. I only see two, I don't see anyone in uh, city-based. Uh, do people choose? Okay, great. Someone just joined Cody. Looks like Carly could use some more. Um, are you all seeing the option to choose your room? Okay, we got a couple. Mm -hmm. Moses says he doesn't have the option to choose a room. Um, I can assign yeah. people to rooms if you're having trouble. Yeah, Moses, is there a topic that you're interested in? I'm gonna unmute you, Moses. Oh no, I can't do that. I don't have that power. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> the the Pentagon, not the <laughs> Pentagon. Okay, let's move Moses to the Pentagon. And then who else do we have here? We've got. Um, what about you, Ruth? Where would you like to go? I would learn from any one of these because I'm just here to listen. Um, okay. How about in Lucia's group? Okay, great. BDS. Nancy, can you put Tim Nolan in the Pentagon group? Okay, let's put Tim in the Pentagon group. All right. How about you, Kay? Where would you like to go? Can you hear us? Okay, Tim wanted the Pentagon group. So is he? Oh, looks like he's on his way. I think the code pink for me. Okay, let's put you in um, the city-based organizing then, Kay. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. And then Mally, how about you? Welcome back, everyone. I was muted also. Well, yeah. here we are, back in the big group. We, uh, we probably needed that, that whole 15 minutes, but we didn't get it. But <laughs> yeah. oh. for Virgil, he got cut off. Well, but you came a little late. Virgil yeah. had introduced himself earlier. And let's see, here we are. We are back, everyone. Welcome back. Let's see, is the whole team here? Let's. Uh, we've got Carly back. We have... Cody back, terrific. So um, welcome back everyone. And um, I see that our group is a little bit smaller. Um, I just would uh, want to, I wanted to see if there is uh, someone um, from each group who would uh, maybe give us a brief report back. Maybe we could hear from someone from uh, Lucia's group. We didn't talk about having anyone volunteer to do a report back. We were so 
Um, Paul or is Virgil here or? What? Uh, why don't you have Paul? Uh, have Paul. All right. Yeah, yeah. I just um, one of the we've discovered that I guess there's 20 states that made BDS illegal. And the way they did it is by using uh, the word discrimination against Israel. So, um, and then we heard a story of how someone, uh, I think Lucia went to her congressperson and when she talked about how the United Nations said that uh, Israel was, I can't remember what exact, what criticism it was. Um, it was a, it was my state senator. Your, your state senator. Yes, because the United Nations named General Mills in violation of international law. For right, and that was, and his reply was, um, "Well, the United Nations is a little anti-Semitic." <laughs> it was like everyone was like shocked to hear that. Hear this guy so so plainly say that, and so. Um, so yeah, and then I did a Google search and I found that my state is one of the states that makes BDS illegal. Hmm. And I live in New York State. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for um, reporting back on that. Um, new information to me, that's for sure. Um, okay. How about Carly? Um, would you like to report back or is there someone in your group that would like to report back? Yeah, is Elizabeth still here? Would you mind reporting back from our group, just what we chatted about yeah, a little sure. bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it's uh, you. You were great, um, Carly, and you um, used screen sharing and you showed us more about the pledge form. And there are twelve signers so far. I but but then you mentioned like Bernie Sanders and some others that were not on that list. So, um, but the focus is now on rep representatives, not on senators. I think you said. Anyway, and you showed us kind of how to do it, which was great. And then you were going to, we were, we were going to, you were shifting over to Pentagon budget cuts and going to show us the guide to the Pentagon. Is that right? But we didn't quite get there. Mm, <laughs> I, okay. I don't think, I, I'm, um, unless I missed something. <laughs> but it, it was very informative. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and how about Cody's group? Is there someone that like that would like to report back, or if you'd like to report back, Cody? Yeah, I mean, likewise, we didn't um, go over like get a volunteer. Um, but I guess one thing I just wanted to share that I was very inspired by. Um, I was chatting with Jim uh, for a bit, um, and Jim shared that uh, he actually used to be a machinist, you know, working on the supply lines. Um, for some of the, uh, the weapons companies. And I think that it's, it's rare, it rarely goes, it's rarely acknowledged enough how much we need uh, the workers who are often invisible, made totally invisible by the war machine, um, the ones who put their economic livelihood on the line to say, no, I'm not gonna do this anymore. How crucial it is to have them, not just in our movement, but really leading our movement. Um, so I really wanna give Jim another shout out for inspiring me tonight. Um, but yeah, Jim or Kay, any of y'all wanna share a bit more about what we talked about? Well, uh, I'm kind of all new to this. Um, it's the first time I've actually interacted with Code Pink, even though I have watched the movement <laughs> since its creation. But I'm glad to be here and uh, at this moment I just want to learn. So uh, that's about it. That's about all I have to say. Awesome. Super. Great. Well, um, what I'm going to do is um, in the chat, I'm going to pop in a link to a Google form so the campaigners can follow up with you. So all the campaigns that you heard about to tonight um, are listed on this Google form. So um, let's see, can we go, yeah, there we go. So if you sign up, um, click on that, enter your email address and the campaign that you are interested in 
and either Carly or Cody or Lucia or even Dave or myself um, will follow up with you on, um, on one of the campaigns. Um, but Dave, do you have anything that you'd like to add? No, I'll tell you what, we've had, uh, I, I've learned a lot and, and obviously we could probably go on for three hours and, and uh, with this group, because we have a lot of people that are doing really amazing things on the ground. And, you know, uh, oftentimes in the, in the, in activism in the anti-war movement and peace and justice movement, you, you get a lot of talking and not a lot of action. And uh, this is uh, what I, I love about this group is that uh, is the, is the uh, taking the next step and actually, uh, you know, having your belief system and, and, and trying to leverage. And what we all do is try to amplify and, and leverage, mm -hmm. amplify our voices and, and leverage our, our, our networks. And, and, uh, and that's something that takes a little, little doing. You develop relationships during the course of time, but all this stuff is all related. And uh, I know with Veterans for Peace, I definitely want to do work uh, with um, uh, Lucia on the local level. Uh, I got that from I saying, you know what, Lucia and Veterans for Peace and Wham and somebody from Code Pink in Minnesota, we all went together and talked to our representative, uh, you know, our congressperson or senator, it would have much more impact than if we all each individually do it. So I think working with, with fellow groups, and that includes uh, and wherever you are, if you, if you have uh, uh, Unitarians and, and, and Lutherans, there's a lot of progressive Lutherans, especially with Thriving, that would love to, that could really help you get with the pastors to say, uh, if the pastors and the, the congregation say, well, wait a second, what are you doing with our money? This is not good, you know? And, and I, think, I think that uh, there's all these partnerships and working with people and more voices raises the ship. Great, so I think we will go ahead and leave it there um, unless any, if any of our speakers have any final words um, we can go ahead and, and if not, we can go ahead and wrap up for the evening. Yeah. Okay, great. So please. Thank you uh, so much, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Please fill out that Google form. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Cody. Thank, thank you, you, Carly. You thank you, Mary. Doing to break the bonds. Hmm? Break the bonds. Alicia, uh, uh, is anybody working on break the bonds with me? Yes. Break the Bonds. Um, Break the Bonds is uh, part of the BDS Minnesota BDS Coalition. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, have a great evening, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great job, Nancy. Thank, thank you, you Nancy. Dave. Thank You're you. Nancy. Awesome. <laughs> Be with you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. One, one love. <laughs> one love. Okay. Bye-bye, Tim. Bye-bye, Jim. Bye, Ruth. <laughs>